Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Lanny Jones here this afternoon. Uh, Lanny, uh, who is uh, at this point retired, I guess, lives in uh, mostly in Princeton, New Jersey, but also spends some time in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, for eight years, he was the editor of People Magazine, managing editor of People Magazine. Uh, during 37 of his years, he wrote as well as edited for Life, Time, Money, and People magazines. He is currently a board member with the National Council of Lewis and Clark, the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. His books include Great Expectations, America and the Baby Boom Generation, The Essential Lewis and Clark, and most recently, William Clark and The Shaping of the West, which arrived at 7 a.m. this morning <laughs> at our doors. Uh, and Lanny was able to get his first copy when he came through the door uh, later in the morning. Um, so anyways, I said we are very, very pleased uh, to be hosting this event and welcoming Lanny to the Boston Athenaeum. And so without further ado, I will turn these proceedings over to Lanny, who will talk to us about William Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm very happy to be here with, with you today, and, and, and particularly on this day, and, and, and not just because it's Shakespeare's birthday. Uh, it's at the, you're at the end of, your, of the fascinating exhibit you have here on the literature of Lewis and Clark, and I had a chance to see that uh, last night and this morning. And, and the map, I mean, there are many great things in the exhibit here, but the, the amazing uh, Nicholas King map um, that was based upon Clark's own drawings during the expedition. It's just wonderful. And I'm so happy to, happy to see that. It's very moving. Um, then, of course, the weather today speaks eloquently to some of the challenges of the expedition itself. Um, on November 22nd, 1805, Clark wrote in, in his inimitable spelling, Oh, how horrible is the day. And this was after 11 days straight of rain in which their leather clothing was literally rotting off, off their bodies. Now, one of the interesting discoveries I made while working on my biography of Clark <clears throat> is that his cartographic skills are just one of the aspects of this man that are now generally understood. As the, as the current exhibit here demonstrates, there are hundreds of books about the Lewis and Clark expedition, and there are biographies of all the leading uh, members of the expedition, Meriwether Lewis, Chicago Weir, John Coulter, York. There are 10 books alone about the Newfoundland dog, Seaman, who went on the expedition. Yet, as I found out when I began my book four years ago, there's not a single biography of William Clark. It reminds me a little bit of the, one of the Gary Larson Farside cartoons. You see the inside of a log cabin, and a fellow in buckskins is hunched over a desk. Behind him is an older woman holding a newspaper, saying with some heat, Here it is again, William, front page, Lewis and Clark Expedition declared a success. See what I mean? His name is always first. I tell you, son, if you don't do something about this now, you'll be playing second fiddle in the history books. And under the drawing, there's a brief two-word caption, Clark's mother. It's strange how this happened. Lewis's life ended in a suicide three years after the expedition. Clark's life sprawled on for 30 more years, a time in which he became the most powerful federal official west of the Mississippi. You can argue, and I will, that Clark's real significance in the history of the West would be better understood today if he had not gone on the expedition. We would see more clearly what he did afterwards. But he did go on the expedition, and because of that, in part, he became fused with Lewis in the, in the name that we now know as a single word, Lewis and Clark. And for those people who preoccupy the history as a story of great men, the entry points to the Louisiana Purchase and the voyage of discovery have always been limited to two Virginia planters, Thomas Jefferson and his private secretary, Meriwether Lewis. And if the Lewis and Clark expedition is America's odyssey, there's not room for two Odysseuses. And if a hero has a partner, any hero, his other well-known sidekicks like Sasso Panza and Dr. Watson can testify, we often celebrate one companion at the expense of the other. So for most of the century and a half following the expedition, most Americans thought they only needed to know one thing about William Clark. He was the opposite of Lewis. 
In his preface to the 1904 edition of the Journals of Lewis and Clark, Reuben Gold Thwaites, and by the way, that edition, is, a copy of that is here in the exhibit, described Lewis as a kind of explorer of romantic, a man with a poetic temperament who loved flowers and animals. Clark, on the other hand, was a strong, silent type, a man with a large and powerful frame who accomplished things rather than talked of them. So if Lewis was the introspective, mercurial intellectual, then Clark had to be the hardy, reliable, spell and challenge frontiersman. This theme was picked up 50 years later by Bernard DeVoto in The Course of Empire. To DeVoto, Clark was Lewis's compliment, as a compliment in a, quote, extrovert, a genial, outgoing, untroubled by speculation, uninterested in, and probably incapable of abstract thought. So if we understand one person clearly, and Lewis in this case, it is much easier to imagine his mirror opposite than to come to grips with another complicated, unique personality. But the result, as I've said, is to give short shrift to some of Clark's greatest strengths, especially as cartographer, natural historian, ethnographer, and leader of men. Now, at the time, eyewitnesses did not pigeonhole Lewis and Clark the way we do now. In November 1804, in the winter quarters in present-day North Dakota, the explorers encountered Charles McKenzie, a Scottish trader from the Northwest Company. In his journal, McKenzie recorded one of the few written impressions of the explorers made during the expedition. McKenzie wrote, Captain Lewis could not make himself agreeable to us. He could speak fluently and learnedly on all subjects, but his inveterate disposition towards against the British stained, at least in our eyes, all his eloquence. On the other hand, McKenzie wrote, Captain Clark was equally well-informed, but his conversation was always pleasant, for he seemed to dislike giving offense unnecessarily. Now, what do we see here? Certainly, Lewis lacked what we now call emotional intelligence. He could not read a room well. But it's also significant that McKenzie perceived Clark as Lewis's intellectual equal, equally well-informed. This is not the inarticulate frontiersman described by Thwaites and DeVoto. Now, Clark made an indelible impression everywhere he went. When the English-Scottish botanist John Bradbury visited Clark in St. Louis in 1810, he was struck that his host was more intelligent in natural history than from the few opportunities of intercourse might be expected. In 1834, the 26-year-old Salmon P. Chase, Salmon P. Chase, a future Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court under Lincoln, but then an impressionable young lawyer, met Clark at a dinner in Cincinnati. Chase described him this way. He was attired in a brown hunting shirt which opened a little upon the breast. It was furnished with a small cape which was copiously fringed. A quantity of fringe also lined the back of the sleeve from the shoulder to the wrist. The hole was confined to the body by a crimson sash which was tied at one side and the ends hung down to the thigh. Now with that, Clark might have seemed to be another picturesque backwoodsman. But then Chase went on. He described several peculiar plants and flowers and proved as interested in conversation as he was in appearance. And here we find the essence of Clark's personality. He combined great physical vitality with bristling intelligence. Clark was a redhead. He stood about six feet tall. And he had a, a personal charisma that was palpable. I mean, if he were to walk into this room right now, you would know he was here, and, and not just because he was 233 years old. When George Catlin, the painter, met Clark, Clark was later in his life too, but Clark wrote about, I mean, Catlin wrote about Clark's whitened locks are still shaken in roars of laughter and good jest among the numerous citizens who all love him. Now, given all these contemporary accounts of, of Clark's intelligence and personal magnetism, why did historians neglect him? Well, one reason is that Lewis's premature kept his story within a familiar show business pattern of of early success followed by early flame out. But Clark's long life went on and on. He cannot be confined to colonial America, the federal period, the age of Jefferson, or the age of Jackson. In the span of his own life, he was praised by George Washington, and he rented out a room in his house to Robert E. Lee. Now, when Lewis and Clark first met at Fort Greenville in present-day Ohio, shortly after the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, and the signing of the Treaty of Greenville a year later. 
At that time, they might have seemed to have a lot in common. They were both Virginians, Republicans, and soldiers. Both of their families were from Albemarle County, America's first West in the Piedmont, and both were expert woodsmen. Both came from slaveholding families. Both saw Indians as the leading obstacles to the peaceful westward advancement of American civilization. <clears throat> but in fact, their differences were far more prominent than their common qualities. Clark was older by four years and far more experienced. He was a popular second lieutenant in the regular army. He was a command of a chosen rifle company in Anthony Wayne's Legion of the United States. He had seen combat against Indians on, in both militia and army expeditions. He had twice led groups of soldiers down the Ohio to the Mississippi, once as the official representative of the United States government to protest a fortification being built by the Spanish. He and William Henry Harrison were the two most promising young officers in the entire United States Army. Lewis, on the other hand, was an undistinguished ensign. He had never seen combat and had just emerged from an embarrassing court martial resulted from his having drunkenly challenged an officer to a duel. So it's not surprising that when Jefferson later asked Lewis to organize his expedition to the Pacific, the junior man, Lewis, turned to Clark. All five of Clark's older brothers had fought against the British in the Revolution. Three had been captured, one died. George Rogers Clark was an early hero of the expedition. George Rogers is William's older brother by 18 years. He's almost a father figure to William. George Rogers was known as the Hannibal of the West because of his, his daring, daring raid across the Illinois country to capture Vincennes. Twenty years earlier, <clears throat> Jefferson, who really hero worshipped George Rogers, had asked George Rogers to, to be the first person. He, George Rogers was the first person Jefferson ever talked to about making an exploring journey to the Pacific. But George Rogers, at that time, had become disillusioned with his own service and turned him down. Now, when Lewis talked to Clark, he wrote Clark a letter suddenly announcing him to join the expedition. He offered Clark the position of captain and co-commander. This was an unheard of sharing of responsibility for a military expedition. It's not at all clear that Jefferson ever signed off on the idea, although Lewis said he did. When the expected promotion did not go through, not surprisingly it did not go through, but Clark swallowed hard and soldiered on. He was not a man who let his ego get in the way of his objectives. And for that matter, as we know from his later relationship with Chicago Weir, he was not a man who was above stopping to ask a woman for directions when he was lost. Lewis and Clark divided up their operating responsibilities during the journey. And Clark was the better boatman and the navigator. Lewis was a planner and natural historian, often walking ashore far ahead of the boats, laboriously pulled up against the Missouri's current. At one point, Lewis, Lewis measured everything. He, Lewis dealt with life by measuring it. And at one point, he literally measured an anthill. It was 10 inches high. Clark, on the other hand, worked directly with the men on the boat, and thanks to his previous experiences in Indian country, conducted most of the negotiations with the tribes. And Clark clearly had the cooler head. It was Clark who drew his sword and stared down the Lakota Sioux in a tense early confrontation. The more mercurial Lewis hurled a puppy in the face of an Indian who angered him and killed at least one Blackfeet in the expedition's only violent incident. But the important thing to know about their relationship during the expedition is that it worked. In writing, they called one another, my good friend Captain Lewis and my worthy friend Captain Clark, and they meant it. There's no record in their journals or the journals of the enlisted men of any disputes or ill will or disagreement between the captains. They respected one another, and because they did, the men respected them. Aside from his ability as a hunter, which was truly extraordinary, Clark, Clark was probably the second best hunter on, a, on an expedition that had a number of, of expert hunters, most especially George Juilliard. But aside from his ability as a hunter, Clark's real defining characteristic during the expedition was his compassion. He defends an Indian woman who was assaulted by her husband, he upbraids Toussaint Charbonneau when he strikes Chicago Weir. And even though Lewis had been trained to be the expedition's physician, by the time they were heading back from the Pacific on the return to St. Louis, even Lewis conceded that Clark had become the Indians' favorite physician, administering to hundreds of Indians who would gather anticipating their arrival. And after Lewis was shot in a hunting accident, Clark and lay face down in the canoe for three weeks, 
Clark cleaned and dressed his wounds every day. In St. Louis, after the expedition, both men received federal appointments, but they were never able to recapture their effective partnership. Awkward and rigid, not reading the room well, Lewis was ill-suited to his political duties as governor of Louisiana Territory. And Clark was now married to the teenage Julia Hancock of Fincastle, Virginia. Clark worked with Lewis as Indian agent, but he could no longer act as the necessary mediator between Lewis's brilliant but remote personality and a world he could measure but not grasp. So beset by financial difficulties and abusing alcohol and laudanum and opiate, Lewis killed himself on the Nassau's Trace in 1809. But once again, Clark soldiered on. Learning that Lewis had not written a single line of his promised history of the expedition, Clark took over the projects. After further delays, including the bankruptcy of the original publisher, the journals finally came out in a two-volume edition in 1814. That two-volume edition, by the way, is also here in the literature of Lewis and Clark exhibit. It's the Biddle edition of 1814. That unfortunately left out most of the expedition's significant scientific discoveries. But what it did include was a cartographic masterpiece, Clark's so-called master map of the West. Now, during the expedition, Clark had drawn 50 route maps on large sheets of paper, linen paper, and dozens of smaller maps. As early as their winter camp at River de Bois across from St. Louis, Clark had begun to sketch a comprehensive, or what he would call a connected, map of the entire Missouri River drainage. This was based upon his conversations with fur traders and earlier explorers. He compiled the route maps into two large maps during the winters they spent at, on, the, on the expedition at Fort Mandan in North Dakota and Fort Clatsop on the Pacific Coast. Uh, here at the Athenaeum Library, you have a manuscript copy of one of these two maps. Um, it, it is the one I mentioned earlier, the Nicholas King map, that is really a, a marvel to see. And what it really is, is this map is the first map drawn of the continent by someone who had been across it and seen it. And, and that I find just a, a moving, a moving to, to see that and to realize that. But that was still a, that was his first, his first cut on, on, on what the West looked like, was the map you have here. Now, after he returned to St. Louis, Clark gathered more information about the West from other people who followed him. From Ju Ju Juilliard went back to the West. John Coulter went back to the West and discovered what we now call Yellowstone or the area of Yellowstone and explorers like Zebulon Pike. And Clark eventually created a map that he sent to Biddle that appears in the 1814 edition of the journals, the one that's here, that his completed map, the actual manuscript copy, was four feet wide and two feet deep. And this amazing map depicted for the first time the multiple ranges of the Rocky Mountains chain and the outline ranges like the Black Hills. And the vast empty canvas on previous maps, the empty map you see in the Aaron, Aaron Aerosmith map, it's also on exhibit here was now filled in with distinct regions, tall grass and short grass prairies, the Columbia Plain and Basin, the northern Rockies, the coastal rains, all of these things were put into place by Clark on his map. And prominently on Clark's maps uh, were the names of the dozens of tribes who lived there in bold type that continues to undermine the notion that the West was ever an unpopulated wilderness. There's a great myth, of, there were a number of myths of Lewis and Clark, but this is the, the greatest myth, is the idea that they were entering an unpopulated world. It was, a, it was a busy world with tribes up and down the river valleys, all of whom lived on the rivers. Uh, and it was, it was the tribes, the kindness of strangers that uh, enabled Lewis and Clark to succeed in their expedition, as well as their own fortitude. Now, part of the map that, that Clark ultimately drew, the, the uh, 1814 map, the master map of the West, uh, still reflect Jeffersonian preconceptions about what they wanted the West to look like. It's sort of a geography of the imagination. The central Rockies in Clark's map were compressed into a few hundred miles, and the headwaters of all the major rivers of the West, the Yellowstone, Bighorn, Platte, Arkansas, Rio Grande, Colorado, Snake, uh, all rise from a single height of land, barely 50 miles on a side. <clears throat> and most importantly about this map, though, the landscape that Clark saw in his steady blue eyes showed no short overland passage across the continental divide to the Pacific. This was the goal of the expedition. Jefferson asked them to find the shortest water route to the Pacific. There was no water route to the Pacific. There would not be a northwest passage along, along the uh, Missouri River. 
Now, in St. Louis, <clears throat> after Lewis's death, um, and before Lewis's death, when Clark was working as Indian agent and brigadier general of the militia, because of these, these sort of two roles he had, he was drawn into the increasingly bitter conflict between the American settlers and the Indians over the land they shared. And the opposition to American expansion was centered in, uh, on two rising forces. The first, of course, were the tribes, and they were led by the Shawnee brothers, Tecumseh and Tenswatawa, who were assembling a confederation of eastern tribes with the goal of expelling whites from Indian country. And the other opponent was someone who was not often written about. And it was, it, as a category, it would be the British traders in Canada, but as an individual, it was Robert Dixon, a Canadian trader and agent who became something like Clark's alter ego. Dixon, like Clark, was a tall, robust, red-headed Scotsman with a full, florid face, an engaging manner, and commanding presence. Dixon, like Clark, was known for his intelligence, fairness, and compassion. He was at home in two worlds. He was a member of Montreal's elite Beaver Club, but also spoke the Sioux languages as well as French, with all with the Scottish Burr. On his expedition up the Mississippi in 1805, Zebulon Pike met Dixon and described him as another Clark. Quote, a gentleman of open, frank manners and possessing much geographical information of the Western country. The Sioux Indians, who trusted Dixon more than any other European, called him the redhead man. This is the exact phrase that they use also for Clark later. Now, at this time, as hostilities were increasing on the, on the, really on the upper Mississippi, the Americans were almost pathetically weak. To the, this is in the, in, at the beginning of and the outset of the War of 1812. To defend the entire Mississippi Valley, they had 240 regular army soldiers and perhaps 2,000 eligible young draftees. Most of the American army was, in fact, fighting the war in the Great Lakes and in the East. So when the War of 1812 broke out, most settlers west of the Mississippi thought theirs was a lost cause. And the combination of British and thousands of Indian loyalists would surely drive them back across the Mississippi. Louisiana would be lost unless they found a leader. Well, and the leader they found turned out to be William Clark. Although he had declined the territorial governorship after Lewis's death, saying he was not calculated to meet the storms that might be expected, in July 1813, Clark accepted President Madison's appointment to become governor of what was then called Missouri, Missouri Territory. And he was also the commander of the, of the militia, so he was in charge of the, entire, the army, the, the armed forces, and the entire governmental apparatus in the West. So at 42, Clark was the most powerful man in the West. What would he do? Well, his first step was to attempt to, this is in one of his most wonderful malaprops, Flusterate the plans of Mr. Dixon. I love to flusterate the plans of Mr. Dixon. He led a, a armed expedition up the Mississippi River that consisted of five armed keelboats, or keelboats with cannons, rigged up with cannons, who were really galleys. Five armed keelboats and 200 soldiers. And they captured Dixon's trading post at Prairie du Chien, at, um, on the upper, uh, a trading outpost on the upper, upper Mississippi. Clark had a new fort built and returned down river to St. Louis on July 18th, 1814, June 18th, 1814. He then celebrated what he and all the citizens thought was a successful expedition at a triumphal dinner at William Christie's Missouri Hotel. On that same evening at the celebratory dinner, a British-led force of 650 soldiers and Indians returned to Prairie du Chien and recaptured the fort. And what had started as an American triumph ended in a fiasco with 22 men killed. It was really the blackest month of the war. In the East, the federal buildings in Washington, D.C. had been burned by a British army. And in the West, on the, on the Mississippi, there was no obstacle between the, the British and Indian force in the North, and they had a clear route to the undefeated, undefended city of St. Louis and ultimately to New Orleans. How to stop this? How to prevent this, this impending disaster? Clark did what he, he himself said he had reservations about, but he enlisted the Indian tribes, the local friendly Indian tribes around St. Louis as their allies, and turned them against the pro-British tribes to the north. And so the, the Osage tribe in Missouri and the relocated Delaware Indians became the allies and, and were essentially mercen hired mercenaries of the St. Louis settlers hired to go to war against the pro-British tribes to the north. It was not without its irony that Americans were turning in desperation 
to Indians to defend them. The danger did not really end until the Treaty of Ghent ended the War of 1812 diplomatically, and Andrew Jackson's victory at New Orleans in January 1815 ended it militarily. Now, with the end of the war, the Indians had lost what had been their greatest strategic advantage uh, throughout this time, which was they could play the British and Americans off against one another. But now the British were essentially retreated to Canada. The, 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 the post-war definition um, it, uh, was that the, all the original treaty lines would stand, and so they were gone. The Indians had no, more, no player to play off. Clark then used this diplomatically to his advantage and convened the first ever Grand Council of the Indian tribes ever held of the tribes, the Plains tribes, and the tribes west of the Mississippi in 1815 to Portage des Sioux, a, a old French, French crossing uh, just above St. Louis uh, at the junction of the Missouri and Mississippi. And at, at the, the Grand Council of Portage des Sioux, the tribes on the upper Mississippi and Great Plains pledged peace with the United States, but also placed themselves under the exclusive jurisdiction of the American government. So the American government now had the right, essentially, to control the future of the tribes, and for the first time, they had, they had obtained the right of navigation in the entire Mississippi Valley. This had never happened. The, the disputes over the Mississippi Valley had, had led originally to the Louisiana Purchase, to Burr's conspiracy, and finally, only after the end of the War of 1815 and the, and the Treaty of Portage de Sioux, did, a, did, did, a, did the Americans control the entire length, length of the Mississippi River? <clears throat> what was the impact of that? Well, the settlers who had stopped crossing the Mississippi during the War of 1812 resumed their, their settlement. In the six years after 1814, the population of Missouri Territory exploded from 25,000 to 65,000. And with them was a new merchant class in St. Louis and in the West bringing different attitudes about class and race to the frontier. And this ultimately becomes the defining theme of, of the second half of Clark's life. When we assess Clark's character now, it's posing the same problem that we often face with many of the founding figures like Jefferson, which is the issue of race. Clark was a slaveholder in a slaveholding state. He took his... his, his personal slave, York, on the expedition. But when they returned to St. Louis, and Clark went, I mean, York went every step of the expedition with Lewis and Clark. Uh, he was unpaid. He carried a rifle. When he returned to St. Louis, York asked for his freedom so he could join his wife, who was in Louisville. And Clark refused to give him his freedom. And when York protested, and the only, only way that a slave at that time really could protest was by withholding his service. So when, when, Clark, when York withheld his service, Clark had him whipped and thrown into jail. It's not a pretty picture uh, that, that one has of Clark when you look at, at his, at his uh, relationships with, as a slaveholder. Later on, he had a, one of his slaves, Venus, became pregnant, and, and uh, Clark whipped her when she was pregnant. And then when they had to call in a, a, uh, a midwife to assist Venus in, in her delivery, Clark complained that he had to pay the fee for the midwife. He took a slave with him to to uh, the inauguration of Andrew Jackson uh, in 1829. And uh, the slave misbehaved uh, during the inauguration. And, and Clark at that time, I think, was, was old enough that he was no longer whipping slaves, so he paid someone to whip, to whip Allen. In any event, his activities as a slaveholder were not unusual in St. Louis. It was a slaveholding state. But there was a strong anti-slavery movement in St. Louis. Um, the editor of the local newspaper, Joseph Charles, Clark, attacked Clark in the newspaper for provoking the suicide of one of his slaves, Scipio, after threatening to sell him down the river. In 1826, the prominent anti-slavery figure, Judge J.B.C. Lucas, wrote directly to President John Quincy Adams to complain that, quote, this William Clark has nothing to recommend him personally except his trip to the Pacific Ocean. Well, <laughs> that wasn't bad, you know. <laughs> Now, some of this is the kind of rough-and-tumble style of frontier politics. And when, the state of, when the territory of Missouri became a state in 1820, they had their first gubernatorial election, and Clark ran, ran for public office for the first time to become, to become governor. 
But now the new, the new ambitious merchant class that had arrived in St. Louis did not look so kindly on the old, the old frontier Creole elite of, uh, of Clark and, and the Soteau family. And they complained that they had not made land available for settlement. They complained that, that uh, Clark and the, and the Soteaus were, were too easy on the Indians, that in order to do the deal with the Indians at the Treaty of, of Portis de Sioux, they had given away $20,000 worth of gifts to the Indians. And this was seen as an outrage at, at the time by, by the settlers. It was, it was reward, you put it in today's terms, it was rewarding terrorists. I mean, the, the Indians were terrorists who attacked and murdered, and here we were to seek to find a truce with them. We paid them $20,000. It was unthinkable that this would happen. It seems ironic in the, in the light of Clark's later life that, that the, the greatest flaw that most of his citizens, his fellow citizens, saw in him was that he was too kind to the Indians. <clears throat> he was further charged with, being, with trading with the Indians during the war. With, they accused him of having an Indian wife mixed race, and having a mixed-race child who was being educated at public expense in St. Louis. The mixed-race child was probably Pompey or Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau, who was the, the son of Chicago Weir, who was born immediately before the expedition left uh, Fort Mandan and who went on the expedition throughout. Clark, as I said, Clark was a, was a, a, hard to get your arms around all of Clark's aspects. He was at heart a compassionate man. And he, and he befriended Chicago Weir during the expedition more than any other person on the expedition. And she returned that. She gave Clark gifts. She, she gave him uh, roots when, you know, and bread uh, when they were most hungry. She gave him a, t- a tippet of ermines um, on Christmas Day um, in, in 1805, a, a holiday that would have meant nothing, nothing to, to her. Uh, she, she was a Sassoni and a Hidatsa. In any event, uh, because of all the, uh, the, the, brutal, the brutal politics in the territory, and also because Clark left and didn't really campaign, he went back to Virginia because his wife was dying at the time. She did die uh, uh, during the election. He was defeated in a landslide. And he was sensitive to criticism, and the attacks during the election stung him. And ten years later, when he met with uh, Washington Irving, who was visiting St. Louis, Clark sought to... Pers- and Irving, Irving, Clark knew, was a Federalist and a, 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 New, a New England liberal. Clark tried to persuade Irving that he had actually freed York, and, th- and that he had not, not, uh, not uh, done anything other than try to help York. But this assertion notwithstanding, in, in my research for my book, I, was, I could find no evidence that Clark ever freed any slaves except in legal charades, which were done at the time essentially to convert a slave into an indentured servant so they could still have slaves in, in so-called free territory. Now, after, after the election, Clark was reappointed superintendent of Indians at St. Louis. And then he operated as something like a colonial grandee out of Conrad or Graham Greene. He was the most prominent citizen in town. He handled all negotiations with all Indians coming through, coming through St. Louis and, in fact, coming through in and out of the West. He gave permissions to all settlers, such as the Astorians, to go up to the, go up to the, to the Missouri and to the coast, and to trappers like William Astley, who, who, found, who went west to create the mountain man rendezvous system. He turned part of his Indian treaty house into the first museum west of the Mississippi. And in it, he kept an array of, of Indian objects and beads, costumes, weapons, prehistoric fossils, even a canoe hanging from a ceiling. It far exceeded Jefferson's beloved Indian treaty room in Monticello. Any trader who wished to enter the vast region beyond St. Louis would have to get a passport personally signed by Clark himself. In other words, he had more unilateral power than the president himself. <clears throat> now, these issues involving uh, Clark's slaveholding and ultimately the Indians, I think get at the real reason why Clark has been overshadowed and why his story has not been told until now, I hope. Um, it is, I think that we've avoided writing about the full extent of his career because it helps us avoid confronting the, the, the broader and disturbing and discomforting contradictions in the American character itself on the borderlands in the eight, 19th, eight, late 18th and early 19th centuries. I mean, Clark was so American that he embraced not only our strengths but our flaws, and we've had difficulty accepting the latter. And this begins with what was surely the largest tragedy of the era, the removal of 100,000 Eastern Indians to the West. Now, this began before the, before the Trail of Tears and before Andrew Jackson became president. 
they were sort of removed on a, on a treaty basis, tribe, one by one, tribe at a time. And Clark's job was to obtain land in the west for the eastern Indians to migrate into. And then he would move, just keep moving those tribes further west. Now, Clark carried out these removals because, like many well-intended Americans, he persuaded himself it was in the best interest of both Indians and their white neighbors. It was, if, it was as if he wanted to prove the maxim, famous, often quoted maxim by F. Scott Fitzgerald, that the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. In Clark's case, the two opposed ideas he held in his mind were these. First, that removing the Indians was necessary to save them. They, they would otherwise be, be wiped out by unscrupulous uh, uh, um, American traders and, and land, land uh, speculators. Removing them was necessary to save them, but that the act of removing them was killing them. And he knew both of those things were true. He signed 37 treaties with the sovereign nations. Clark's name is on more treaties with sovereign nations than any American diplomat in the history of the country. And he extinguished Indian title to 400 million acres. He never once objected to the removal policy of the federal government. To the contrary, he faithfully carried it out. He was a good soldier, and because he felt it was in the best interest of the Indians and their white neighbors. And in fairness to him, he was hardly in a position to do much about it. The Indian removal policy ultimately was the key to Andrew Jackson's presidential campaign in 1828. On the other hand, to his credit, Clark frequently complained about the way the policy was implemented. In 1823, he writes to the aging Thomas Jefferson, it is to be lamented that the deplorable situation of the Indians do not receive more of the humane feeling of the nation. Close quote. Now, he did not mean that the Indians should not be removed. He meant they should be taken better care of during their removals. And travelers, and he did, he tried to do that. Travelers like Charles Augustus Murray traveled to, to the West and reported back that Clark was, quote, held in high respect and estimation by the tribes. And like many visitors, Murray observed that Clark was called the red-headed father or sandy-haired father by the tribes. Now, the assertion that Clark was held with affection by the Indians can strike, strike us now as a little puzzling. The Indians did call Clark the red-headed father, but did they really, really love him, or was this a rhetorical device of the times? I think it was really that. Or had Clark disarmed them with his easy manner, just he had disarmed Charles McKenzie on the upper, upper Missouri during the expedition. But actually, I think the idea that Clark was beloved by the Indians and was their red-headed father was encouraged and repeated by those Americans who wanted to believe that Indians themselves approved and supported the removal policy. After all, if the Indians loved the man who implemented the Indian removal policy, was that not convincing evidence that the policy must be fair and just? Clark personally took steps to ease the human misery he witnessed. St. Louis at his time was so crowded with migrating Indians, it became the largest refugee camp on the continent. But Clark stressed his budget to provide food, clothing, and shelter for starving Indians, and when necessary, dipped into his own funds. In the last year of Clark's life, Ethan Allen Hitchcock, who was the grandson of the Green Mountain Boy and a former commandant of West Point, was sent to St. Louis to help out at the Indian office. Hitchcock had a reputation for integrity and compassion, but he was at once impressed with, the, with Clark's own humanity and kindness, which never fails. Not long after arriving, he told his superiors in Washington how Clark had come across a group of 14 destitute Indians who had been hired by a local museum owner to dance for the public. And Clark was so offended by this spectacle that he personally offered to pay the Indians out of his own pocket to prevent them from what he called dancing their way to Washington. Sometime I want to write a book with that as a title, Dancing Their Way to Washington. Clark later told Hitchcock that with regard to a treaty he had signed in 1808 with the Osage tribe in Missouri, which took away most of their land in Missouri, that if he were ever to be damned hereafter, it would be for making that treaty. Now, how do we sort this out now? What do we want about or from Clark to feel better about him today? Do we wish that he had resigned in pro protest, or do we wish he had worked tirelessly to change the removal policy, or to have written just one letter among his thousands of words stating how repellent and foreseeably tragic the removal policy was? But he could not write that letter. He did not believe it. He sincerely thought the removal policy was the Indians' last best hope. 
It's hard for us now to understand how deep racial paternalism was buried in antebellum life. Fourteen years after Clark's death, at the age of 68, 1838, the Indian agent Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, in whose Schoolcraft's collection of Indian uh, writings and documents is here at the Athenaeum Library, archived here. Schoolcraft came across Clark's name this is long after his death, in a list of members of England's Royal Geographical Society. Schoolcraft then wrote a letter to the society to inform them Clark had died. In his letter, Schoolcraft tried to sum up Clark's life. He said, few men have ever been more respected. General Clark was a man of strong and vigorous mind and commanding character. Then he added, and he was a fine physical representative, physically, mentally, of the Anglo-Saxon race in America. Close quote. The story of Lewis and Clark appears to us now because it exists in its own time frame, a self-contained epic that seemingly disconnected the explorers' lives uh, from the American history before and after the expedition. And Clark would surely be more approachable and maybe seem more heroic if his life had ended as Lewis has did not long after the expedition. But the fact is he lived on, caught up in the painful issues of race and the operating mechanics of operating an empire, that does not diminish his heroism or our need to understand him. Clark's contributions to the development, to the development of the West include both the historic, historic story of the expedition and the disturbing story of Indian removal. If we are to understand him, we must get our arms around his complexity and hold it with all the accompanying flaws and wrongheadedness and not deny it in favor of a simple analysis. William Clark shaped the West. His deeds made him heroic. His failings made him commonplace. We need to tell both stories in order to come to terms with the forces that shaped Clark and us. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to take questions if, if uh, it's a long, complicated story. Yes, sir. famous French visitor, writer, who wrote Democracy in America, whose name I forget. Uh, Tocqueville? Tocqueville? No. Uh, no. Um, Tocqueville came down, went down the Mississippi River and, and, and wrote a number of uh, vivid descriptions of uh, Indian removal one of which I quoted in my book. Uh, but he never, and Tocqueville never met Clark that I know of or wrote any description of him. Clark m did meet almost every prominent American of his time. I mean, not just every American. He met, he met six or seven presidents, presidents all the way from, from, from Washington uh, to Van Buren. Um, he, met, he met General, the Marquis de Lafayette, who's busted sits right over there when Lafayette came to St. Louis on the 50th anniversary of the Revolution. He later sent Lafayette a live grizzly bear uh, that Lafayette uh, got and made it alive to Paris, and Lafayette released it in the, in the, in the Jardin or the plant or whatever, whatever they call it in Paris. And uh, it, it later wrote Clark a great diplomatic letter saying, well, the grizzly bear has arrived, <laughs> and, but he's exhibiting some ferocious behavior. We have decided to treat him with care. And, yeah, anyway, yeah, yes. With the what again? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, when they returned from the expedition, Jefferson was still in office. Yeah. And, uh, and Jeff, it was Jefferson who appointed uh, Lewis and Clark to their post-expeditionary jobs. And, and they, they, got double, they got double pay. They, they received pay and an allotment of, of acreage. And I, 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 so he, I think Lewis and Clark had... had uh, yeah, anyway, they, they, they got double pay. They got double the military pay, plus, plus 480 acres or section or half section of land. And, um, and, and Clark ultimately was not paid uh, as, a, as a captain, even though he, he performed all the duties of, of a captain. But, but he, got, he was made a brigadier general in the militia and was paid for that and paid for superintendent. So they did not suffer in that sense. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think the, um, the Clark was, some, was a minor celebrity at the time, and and uh, and he was famous in Italy because of his famous older brother. And I think he always saw, him, saw himself somewhat overshadowed by his dysfunctional older brother. George Rogers Clark had a, had a terrible drinking problem and ultimately, you know, fell into a fire and died. And Clark spent five years trying to bail out George Rogers Clark's financial problems. Clark was very good at this. And, and Meriwether Lewis was dysfunctional. And, and Clark was overshadowed by him. He dealt well with these people. I'm not really answering your question. Um, they were wined and dined and toasted. Um, when they got back. But then p- people began to forget about Lewis and Clark. And, and certainly during, by the time of the War of 1812, the books had not, the, his book had not come out. Uh, and it was, he had started to be overshadowed by, by Pike and, and, the, and the mountain men and, and it's sort of the legend of, you know, the, the increasing legend of Daniel Boone, who Clark also knew, and, uh, and Jim Bridger and people like that began to overshadow, overshadow Clark. And ultimately, in American history, John Wesley Powell, Fremont, these later explorers all overshadowed him. And, the, and by the turn of the century, Lewis and Clark had been pretty much forgotten. Uh, it's only recently, since World War II, that they've started to reclaim their, their deserved, I think, a prominent, prominent place in our history. Um, okay. Yes? Thank you. A uh, comment rather than a question. I'm so interested, uh, as an anthropologist, in Clark's relationships with Indian people and the way they viewed him. And uh, just two comments on that point. Mm -hmm. Last night, um, I hosted a talk by Tex Hall at Harvard, who's chairman of the National Congress of American Indians and tribal chairman of Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation. And he was relaying oral history testimony to the effect that um, forebears and other people in that tribe had a genuine affection for Clark and that many tribal leaders at that time felt that Clark truly understood and cared about Indians in a way that other people they dealt with may not have. And Um, it it is a difficult thing to deal with, but there's one piece or one side of the context that you didn't mention that I think is helpful in understanding Clark, and that is to not measure his attitudes strictly uh, in contrast to those we have today, but to the alternatives that existed during his lifetime, because um, although he, you know, one thing, people are human beings as well as government servants, and the Indian people responded to Clark as as a person. Um, and he did try to help them in some ways. But also, he was considered a liberal, and there have been many other examples of similar mistakes Mm -hmm. in the history of Indian-white relations. Later in the 19th century, the most liberal uh, thinkers in America, the, the, the defenders of the Indians, thought that land allotment was going to be their saving grace, and that turned out to be another huge disaster and very devastating for tribes. But people genuinely thought that it was a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, Henry Rose Schoolcraft, whose collection is here at this library, um, knew more about the tribes than, than almost anyone. And certainly, uh, having said that, he, he was also an enthusiastic supporter of the Indian removals. Um, one of the, someone once um, made an observation at a, a Lewis and Clark meeting I went to in, when he said that, that Lewis and Clark would be so shocked if, if they were to see uh, what had happened to the Indians since the expedition, how, how poor they were, and, and you know, the, the, the populations had diminished. And, um, actually, it's, 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 it's almost quite the contrary. I think if Lewis and Clark, were to, Clark especially, would be here today, and, 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 in, and, and literally in this room today, and here you say that, he would be so amazed that Tex Hall was here, that Indians were here at all. I mean, they, it would be stunning to him that, that the Mandan Hidatsa tribal leader would be in Boston uh, giving a speech. Or that you could go to Monticello, as I did at the beginning of the bicentennial, and see, and see uh, Indians in, in their magnificent you know, tribal costumes on the lawn of Monticello, and, and thriving. This was dumbfounding. They thought the Indians would, would, either, it would be assimilated completely, you know, or, or, or exterminated. The, the, those were the only options that were seen. So 
I, mean, I agree with you that, that in, in, the Indian saw it as sympathy in Clark about the, but, but I, I, I'm trying to say that in the book, basically, that he wanted to do right by them, but, but some really awful things happened as a result. I mean, the forebears died of, died of the smallpox on, on, uh, in, in 1837. The, people loved, he, he loved the, the, the Americans, but he died a bitter man. Yes. Yeah, this, some of the Indians, uh, Clark never went with them to the land. No, but, but other Indian agents did. And uh, but it, it's awful ironies. I mean, when the Seneca tribe was removed from Ohio, you, you, or the whole way they traveled, their horses were stolen by whites all, all along the way. This, this is ironic for those who read about the Lewis and Clark expedition when, they, when their horses were stolen by Indians. And so some of the land wasn't terrible, but, but they were, but if it, I mean, once they got there, the Americans just tried to get their hands on it as quick as they could, and, and they often did. And, and, and they would divide it. They would, they would save some good land for the Indians and some land for the speculators. Yes, sorry. Uh, how would you compare his mapping to others of the times as far as quality and accuracy is concerned? I'm sorry, what was that again? How would you compare his mapping oh. of the, uh, with others of the times as far as accuracy and uh, uh, quality? It, it, the, he was the best. He was the best map maker of his of his generation. I, I think. I mean, except for the professionals like King, who was in Washington. I mean, Clark mapped on the Missouri through dead reckoning and sort of pretty primitive celestial navigation. And you you, you hold up the maps against a, a contemporary map, and, and people do this all the time. And and they'll be be off, you know, over a distance of thousands of miles. You'll be off 16 miles or something. It's 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 incredibly accurate. And also, they're beautifully, they're beautifully executed. Uh, it's some of the rude maps, there's one in my book that I, I printed a full page of because it, it's just so revealing and so interesting, uh, the kind of detail. But the, this dead reckoning, I don't know how, he, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how they did that. He was a gifted draftsman, uh, and he was, a, he was a good artist. You see his artistry and other things. He went down, the, it's a long, another whole long story, but he went down the Mississippi River as a young man on, on a, this government mission. And he didn't keep any records because he was afraid he'd be captured by the Spanish. He comes back to Fort Washington and then draws a, a map of, of everything he saw that's incredibly accurate. And this he, he did from recall. So I don't know. I, I, I think most cartographers and, uh, and, uh, and historical geographers who study this think Clark is really quite remarkable. I think it's, it's, it's really his single great contribution, you know, is his map making. Okay. okay, thank you. <laughs>